in the wilds of North London where I live, uh, near Highgate Cemetery, is a grave and a tombstone of the wily old political economist who's the subject of tonight's debate. Many of you may have been there uh, to pay homage or simply to visit and reflect. But the revival of interest in Karl Marx since the financial crisis and the reason he's here in spirit this evening is because we're suffering, as I'm sure you know, an attack of deep economic pessimism. You'll also know uh, very well that our fixation with this pessimism and crisis and capitalism is not unique. For example, John Maynard Keynes wrote about this in 1930 in a tract called The Economic Consequences for Our Grandchildren, in which he said, it is common to hear people say that the epoch of enormous economic progress is over and that a decline in prosperity is more likely than an improvement in the decade ahead of us. Eerily familiar words, but my view is that Keynes's dismissal of the pessimism of his own time has relevance today. And I'd like to argue two points. First, that the whole point about the contradictions of capitalism is not specifically whether Marx's, or Marx's analysis is relevant, which personally I think in many ways it is, uh, but it's the outcome, it's the synthesis and our capacity to basically nurture and establish coping mechanisms. And the second point is that the main threats to our economic and social model today come actually from two sources that didn't even exist until quite recently and are neither the direct outcrop of capitalism nor terminal. So the first point, on Marx's tombstone, as you'll know if you've been there, there's an inscription taken from the thesis on Feuerbach which says, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it, which is precisely what our antecedents have done by developing coping mechanisms like institutions of the rule of law, limited liability companies, trades union, mutual societies, insurance, welfare, and technological uh, discoveries that drive productivity, income, and jobs. Finding those coping mechanisms is an endless task, and we need to make more progress on at least three of them. The first is that we can't obviously keep shifting income from the owners of labor to the owners of capital without experiencing income inequality, impoverishment of workers relatively, if not absolutely, excess capacity and unemployment. The stronger investment that we had in the 1990s and the 2000s has of course given way to a bust. Real wages have been stagnant or declining. In this country, the median real wage has fallen by about 9% since 2009, back to levels last seen in 2003 and the labor compensation share of the national income has fallen, profit share has risen by about five to 10 percentage points in most rich countries. The second uh, point is that finance, or the second contradiction if you want, is that finance has been an enabler of innovation and growth, but as articulated poignantly by the economist Hyman Minsky 30 years ago, it's also an endogenous source of systemic instability. I'm sure this doesn't need to go into any further explanation here, except to say that as the uh, raconteur and economist and diplomat J.K. Galbraith once quipped about recurring bouts of speculation and euphoria from Rome onwards, every generation uh, basically suffers from a brevity of financial memory and every generation makes the specious association between the ownership of money and the possession of intelligence. Bankers' pay and the wider issue of management remuneration, of course, are rarely out of the headlines and an obvious grappling iron for capitalism's critics. But the problem is that rent gouging, or rent seeking as it's more politely known, is the result of eminently fixable market and corporate governance flaws. We could, for example, break up the banks, as the Vickers Commission has urged. Uh, we could ban or restrict the use of stock options and other tools that tie remuneration to short-term stock market performance. There's nothing specifically systemic about not being able to fix these problems if we really want. The third point I'll just quickly mention is the need to cope better with globalization. Capitalism's propensity to globalize has generally been a force for the good, I'd submit, but the blowback in the form of the growing economic significance of China and other major emerging markets is a big problem integrating in their own ways Western capitalism's best practices from markets to modernity and from meritocracy to the rule of law 
these countries are no longer just consumers of Western capitalism's goods and services, and in some respects clones, but also very powerful competitors and rivals. Big, big contradiction issues, without a doubt. But my point is that even if our existing political leaders suffer from myopia and something that I like to call deficit attention disorder, <laughs> thank you, uh, the, capitalist <laughs> the capitalist model has been and remains adaptable. Now, the two points I mentioned earlier, which are relatively recent, are 21st century aging and technology, which actually have, in some respects, the flimmiest, flimsiest of links to capitalism uh, and are questionably, though, big issues. For example, in the first case, weak fertility and rising life expectancy are driving a unique and relentless rise in the age structure of our societies, never seen before. And it's challenging us to redefine the social rights and obligations of citizens versus the state. It's a very complex issue to get over, particularly at a time like this. And the thing about technology and automation is that they are also displacing white collar, including skilled jobs, from retail to radiology and from clerical to even legal positions. And I think this explains partly the predominance of low income, part time jobs in countries that even have raised employment since 2009. Modern technology is equally an issue for emerging countries. For example, in China, the Taiwanese company Foxconn, who, as you know, manufacture for Apple, Sony, and lots of others in China, has started to substitute robots for workers. Their plan is to substitute one million by 2015. Automation and robots are generating very strong demand for labor at the top of the occupational structure and the bottom, leaving as my opponent Tristram said before, uh, those with average levels of human capital and skill in the middle, very vulnerable and dragging income inequality higher. We don't really know how we're going to solve this problem in the long run, but capitalism still has very persuasive credentials. Let me give you two little anecdotes. First, Henry Ford and a prominent labor leader supposedly once teased each other about factory robots not being able to pay union dues or buy motor cars. Henry just simply retorted oh, that he was going to pay his workers twice the going rate, which he did, which underscores a process in capitalism that runs from productivity to higher wages and lower prices, rising demand and jobs and so on. There's also a story about Milton Friedman visiting a Chinese construction project and asking his host why workers were using so many shovels and so few machines. Told that this was a job creation project, Friedman said, in that case, why don't you give them spoons? <laughs> the point, of course, is that capital, including human capital, makes people more productive and societies better off. And my hunch is that in time, the revolution going on in advanced manufacturing and the energy sector and new technology uh, will deliver significant benefits. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, our opponents may argue that capitalism itself is the systemic problem behind our pessimism and that markets don't work, and that a radical redrawing of the boundaries between the state and the private sector is necessary. Personally, I don't think anyone thinks that laissez-faire is the answer, but we should be careful what we wish for. The influential Chinese magazine, Kashin, warned the country's leaders recently that the heavy, stand of the heavy hand of the state was stifling competition, distorting resource allocation, and encouraging corruption and rent-seeking and social fragmentation. China's leaders have the courage and will to implement difficult reforms in the next five to ten years. Chinese capitalism will move our way. If they don't, we shall see. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, our predicament, I would submit, is not the sound of capitalism falling apart, but a painful period of adjustment from one economic and technological period to another. Thank you.